Thank you for including us in your annual commemoration of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, we are here today because the Marshallese refused to whisper and um, we really want to acknowledge before I move on um, the hurtful history of um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, as soon as we walked in, Senji was in a circle with some of us um, showing us a photo of a young boy. And I'm not gonna go into the details of that, but I, I just wanna thank you for sharing you know, your time with us and for uh, making that entry so meaningful for us. And um, uh, here's a slide of um, a time that we got to go to Green Lake for the Hiroshima Nagasaki Observance Day. Maybe some of you have done this before. Maybe you did this last night. I unfortunately didn't get to do it this year. Um, so before I move on, I, I do want to just have a moment of silence, if that's okay with everybody. Let's just have a moment and just let your hearts just get grounded and um, let's also just remember all of the lives that, um, that have been impacted and are still impacted today. And um, yeah, so let's have a minute. Okay. Um, I wanna thank Ground Zero for giving us this space this year so that we can unify our stories and um, strengthen our walk together towards peace. Um, our small team is here on behalf of the Marshallese Women's Association and the Seattle and Everett Marshallese Community Associations. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about why our Marshallese people are attracted to Washington State. There are better opportunities for health care and education. There is a good chance of earning a stable income to provide quality living for the family and of course, we tend to stick together and provide the comfort of each other's company, which is why there are so many of us Marshallese residing here in Washington State today. There hasn't been an accurate count of how many Marshallese are living here, but we estimate that there are at least 10,000 around the Seattle and Everett areas. This is excluding the count in Spokane, which has the second greatest Marshallese community to Arkansas. The women and men who, are you, who you are seeing today are um, powerful advocates and servants of our community. And so what we need to do, we would like to build programs to set individuals on paths to higher paying jobs. Um, we need our people to have access to financial literacy. Um, we need higher education attainment, healthy habits. We need a system in place that can ensure that professionals in healthcare, education, housing and other programs are providing culturally responsive services to the Marshallese that they serve in our highly concentrated areas. We want to have a facility for our people where we can have our church, sports, and cultural functions, um, and also a place where our elders and our youth can consider a safe haven. We want to build our civic engagement capacity and lobby for this climate crisis and for nuclear peace. There is a lot of opportunity for developing a solid network of support for the Marshallese community, and any help is greatly appreciated. One of our greatest values in our culture is laleron, which means to watch over each other. We have an order in our culture of how we treat our elders, rear our children, respect our leaders, chiefs, and landowners. We all know our roles in our family. We have several phrases in our language that define the characteristics and roles of men and women. For example, I have heard my auntie say, Mama and Marongrong, when my son was born, referring to, <coughs> referring to how I am blessed that he will help me as I age with his good strength of a man. 
And there is Karainjuan Japugayo. This term is about a woman who retains the peace and customs in her household that is passed down to her through the mothers of thousands of generations before her. Historically, our society was built on a concrete system of land ownership and land distribution. It is said that if you don't have land, then you are not Marshallese. And therefore, if a Marshallese does not have land, then they lose their identity. Our land is passed through the lineages of the mother side of the family, which makes our society matrilineal. As a woman, I have always adored this piece about my culture. The land provides our family stability and a home for our children and children's children through the mother. I was talking with my auntie Winnie over here on the couch with her purple shirt. I was asking her what part of the culture should we preserve um, in her opinion. And she was telling me she really wants us to protect the way that we look after one another and respect our elders and the way that women and men conduct themselves around each other. In our communities here or back home, nobody goes hungry or unloved. We are humble, soft-spoken, hospitable, loving. And nobody knew who we were or where the Marshall Islands was located on a map. We were simply the perfect group of people to conduct the nuclear tests. So I'm going to play this video. Um, it's, it's by Kathy Tidenel, who's a poet, really effective climate change activist, and is leading a um, grassroots organization in the Marshall Islands called Jo Jigum, which piggybacks on the work of um, Darlene Keju. Um, so I know that this will speak thousands of messages to you all. I'm coming to meet you. I'm coming to see you. What stories will I find? Will I find an island or a tomb? To get to this tomb, take a canoe. Take a canoe through miles of scattered sun. Swallow endless swirling sea. Gulp down radioactive lagoon. Do not bring flowers or speeches. There will be no white stones to scatter along this grave. There will be no songs to sing. How shall we remember you? You were a whole island once. You were breadfruit trees, heavy with green globes of fruit, whispering promises of massive canoes. Crabs dusted with white sand scuttled through pandanus roots. Beneath looming coconut trees, beds of watermelon slept still, swollen with juice. And you were protected by powerful Iroj, chiefs birthed from women who could swim pregnant for miles beneath a full moon. Then you became testing ground. Nine nuclear weapons consumed you, one by one by one, engulfed in an inferno of blazing heat. You became crater, an empty belly. Plutonium ground into a concrete slurry filled your hollow caverns. You became tomb. You became concrete shell. You became solidified history, immovable, unforgettable. You were a whole island once. Who remembers you beyond your death? Who would have us forget that you were once green globes of fruit, pandanus roots, and whispers of canoes? Who knows the stories of the life you led before? Here is a story of a turtle goddess. She gifted one of her sons, Leda, a piece of her shell anointed with power a leathery green fragment 
hollow as a piece of bark. It gave Lao Lao the power to transform into anything, into houses and trees, the shapes of other men, even kindling for the first fire. He almost burned us alive. I am looking for more stories. I look and I look. There must be more to this than incinerated trees, a cracked dome, a rising sea, a leaking nuclear waste with no fence. There must be more to this than a concrete shell that houses death. Here is a story of another shell, anointed with power. Leodao used it to transform into kindling for the first fire. He gave this fire to a small boy. The boy almost burned his entire village to the ground. Licks of fire leapt from skin and bones, from strands of coconut leaves. While the boy cried, then I laughed and laughed. This is a story of a people on fire. We pretend it is not burning all of us. Here is the story of the ways we've been tricked, the lies we've been fed. It's not poisonous anymore. Your illnesses are normal. You're fine. You're fine. My belly is a crater empty of stories and answers. Only questions, hard as concrete. Who gave them this power? Who anointed them with the power to burn? So like I was saying, we were the perfect group of people to act as guinea pigs of a highly secretive nuclear weapons testing program by the U.S. government. We were silent and cooperative. At the time, few of us knew how to speak English fluently. We used the most basic materials for living, and so we were seen as unsophisticated, mindless, and perhaps animalistic creatures who knew nothing more than how to survive on a remote island. We were simply unworthy of being informed that one of our islands would be wiped off of the face of the earth, poisoning tens of thousands of Marshallese and their future generations, and then, and then being tested like animals to inform the rest of the world of how nuclear weapons affects the human body. So I have a little story to tell you. But before I do, I want you to look at this plastic water bottle. Once you drink it up, what do you do with it? Oh, good. You recycle it. Where do you recycle it? Where do you put it? Where exactly? Where would you put this water bottle? Where did you put an empty water bottle today? In the recycling basket. Good. I do that too. That's good. So. That's what we do, right? We drink up, you know, water from our water bottles. I'm not going to go too far with this. So when we're in the islands and we see these water bottles, 
we take them and we use them and they last for years. What we do is we take the herbs and the coconuts in our islands and we, we, we infuse them with medicine and we, we, um, we sit them in our home like treasures. We have medicine women and men in our communities who use the oil to heal wounds and ulcers. We depend on these oils for our hygiene, health, and well-being, all packaged in a recycled water bottle. We are very resourceful people. And once there was a team of Marshallese men who did some of the cleanup for the US government on Bugani Atoll. And this was shortly after the Castle Bravo detonation, the most powerful thermonuclear weapon ever detonated by the US. There was rubble everywhere. And as you could probably imagine, one of the Marshallese men on the team saw that there were plenty of goods around. And he and the others loaded up a boat with tin roofs and plywood and other materials. They even found a water catchment and a deep sink basin that were in pretty good shape. One of the men took these materials home to Mejoro, which is the capital atoll of Marshall Islands, to build his sister a new home for her family, children, and grandchildren included. Without knowing the aftermath of nuclear weapons, they lived in a home of radiated materials and became exposed to radiation. It seeped into their bodies. There was no way out of it. They had no idea their home was radiated. The people who were accountable for sharing this information didn't think to do so. And um, this family that I'm talking about is Lona's great aunt, and Lona sitting back there. Lona, can you wave your hand? So this is her great aunt and her cousins that she grew up with. And she grew up with one of the girls who was her age. And she had thyroid cancer. And it was nothing that we understood at the time. And she had surgery to remove it. And then as the years went by, all of the families just started passing away. And this story is not unique in our country. All of the women and men that you see here today from the Marshall Islands have stories just like this about our families and friends. And I can't help but mourn for the children. The children from Bugani, Enewetak, Udruk, and Rongolab. The 20 highly contaminated surrounding atolls and from the whole entire country of the Marshall Islands. So shortly after the testing, we had the highest rates of miscarriages and birth defects and an array of cancers. Women from the four atolls talked about these birth defects and how many of them gave birth to strange babies that looked like grapes, jellyfish, as we heard from Darlene Geju in the documentary and from the film. And there were babies with transparent skulls. Some had a missing limb. Some had an extra limb. Mutated baby humans. <laughs> In a culture where the birthing process is sacred, where huts are built just for the cleansing and healing process for the mother, and how the welcoming of a newborn baby is a community effort. The mother is bathed fed the best island food, given medicinal herbal drinks for rapid healing, massaged alongside the newborn baby. It takes many hands to perform this process well. So imagine in a society like this, where a group of women prepare for the birth while the men build a separate space for the postpartum healing, only to welcome, thank you so much, only to welcome a deformed child. Um, there were women during this time who were seen as almost disgraceful. There were women during this time who gave birth and buried their children in secrecy so that nobody would know. And the nuclear effects were fresh among our people. And they had no idea why we were experiencing and suffering from such extreme health conditions. 
One of the other common effects as we, we've been talking about today from the nuclear testing impacts is thyroid cancer. And thyroid cancer has become one of the leading causes of death in the Marshall Islands. This is just one of a number of types of cancers that plague our people as a result of the nuclear testing. The food was contaminated. The fish, the coconuts that we do a bunch of things with. We use this topical oil, we drink it, we eat it. And I was telling you earlier that there were homes that were radiated. So wherever the radiation traveled through the body, it would cause cancer in the mouth, throat, esophagus, stomach, colon, thyroid, brain, bones. There is no question that the nuclear legacy altered almost everything about us. I am not from these four recognized atolls that were directly exposed to the radioactive fallout. My grandmother was at Anno at the time of the Bravo detonation. Later in her adult life, she learned that she had thyroid disease. She filed a report through the claims tribunal and was able to get enough funds to bring some of our family members here to Seattle. She was seeking a quality future for her children and grandchildren. Today I am the first generation college student and the sacrifices made in my family were sacrifices of secure land ownership, a safe family environment where everyone watches over each other, a humble tone language that is spoken day in, day out, nutritious food from our own land and ocean. And so I think to myself, was this a fair trade? When I go to the Marshall Islands, I have no identity because I do not have land to claim as my own, and neither does my son. And I don't know if this will change. And I know so many other Marshallese that could say the same thing. And this also, and especially applies to the people who re were relocated from their homeland of Bugini and Enoedak, who are living in mere exile, like the nomads that we read about in the Bible. Yet they are suffering from generational health conditions. We might be on exile because of so many of these altered factors in our culture when thinking about land distribution. And I'm also going to say that our life expectancy is at 65 years right now. That's 13 years younger than the life, to, life expectancy in the US. That in itself, it tells us that we are cut too soon from our culture, from the ways of our elders. And once our elders arrive in the diaspora and are suddenly in an environment where they they do not remember how to talk about their stories, especially with people who don't even know how to speak our language anymore. Our culture begins to be ripped off of us too soon in our lives. Um, so now I'm going to talk about climate change because climate change is another contributor to this story of exile that I'm, I'm talking about right now. And um, we have Loris in the back who's going to speak more about it. Um, before we do, we're going to watch a short clip from Tony De Bruum, who is a champion of climate change and who fought for an international effort to lower carbon emissions to keep the global temperature from rising no more than 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so I'm going to stop my screen share to share another video. All the speeches and documents that we file in different forums throughout the world on either issue, nuclear or climate change, cannot, cannot
cannot uh, attract the kind of attention that we think they should unless more people are convinced that what they see in documents and they hear in speeches is for real. And hence our willingness and our, well, really our desire to invite the world to come and look and come and see for themselves what it means to be at the total mercy of the sea. And know, to know that people here are happy, people here love their own homeland, and they are not about to pick up and go. There will be those that go to find opportunities elsewhere, of course. But in their hearts, there will always be Marshallese. And that is important for us to share that, that feeling. And the actual destruction to our lands, and to our health, and to our, to our home communities can only be understood if more people see all of this firsthand. We want to share this, not just for our sake, no, no, not just for our sake, but for the sake of the world. Uh, I remember in Rio Plus 20 at the meeting we were coming out of one of the discussions in, in one of the halls there. And we were all in island dress. And I think that the uh, news people and the camera crew, crews realized that we were not quite, we did not fit in the... So they rushed up to us as we were leaving the hall and held microphones in our faces and one of them very carefully asked, are you here to save your islands? And we replied very quickly too, no, we were actually here to save the world. And it's important for people to know that, that these islands may only be the, the as we call it here, the tip of the spear. But if these islands go, will almost be too late to stop the effects of climate change. We need to do it when we can still talk to each other in the same way and in, in, without panic and with the assurance that the science is out there, the resources are out there, the human beings are out there. It's, it's politics and bottom line profits that must be brought to bear on what needs to be done to make things well again. Um, so we are coming to the end of our Marshallese segment. Um, I just want to thank you all again for giving us this space to allow us to not whisper and to share our stories as loudly as we could today. Um, and so Loris is going to come in here and say a bit about what she experiences in, in her current generation or our current generation and um, perhaps that will inspire some of us to see how we can react or respond to that. Um, so Loris, please, please come up. I'm so proud of this girl, by the way. She is the reason why our community has worked so hard. <laughs> My name is Loris, and I am a Marshallese high school student here in Washington. I came to the States barely hitting the age of one and have lived here ever since. So I have yet to experience life in the islands. I would like to go back someday to rekindle with family or to immerse myself in the culture I missed out on. But there is something I fear that I think most of our younger generation also fear. Maybe one day it will be too late. Climate change is actively impacting our environment from the rise in sea level, slowly submerging the beaches and climbing seawalls to the break in, in, in the infamous dome that contains the remains of a tragic history. From 1946 to 1958, 67 nuclear tests were carried out by the US. The Marshallese people who resided 
on the islands were unaware of the risks that may destroy their homes and impact future generations. My people, curious and thrilled to be a part of history, welcomed the American soldiers with open hearts. After the nuclear testings, we questioned our island's longevity. How long will it take before reparations are made? That is one thing I could hope for the future, reparations. When my people seek, refu when my people seek refuge in the land of opportunity because their island lives no longer, I expect to be welcomed with open hearts. We need things such as healthcare, scholarships, and more job opportunities. Right now, it can be very difficult for Marshallese migrants to apply for jobs because of the obstacle of not having a slip of paper, the I-94. Losing this document makes it almost near impossible to find a stable job, though you may have other documents of identification on hand. Our people need support to preserve the longevity of our culture, help better our living in the place that will inevitably become our home. This is all I could hope for the future of my people. Thank you. I would like to ask um, Brenda first if she would like to come up and speak on some of what she's been seeing in our communities. Um, we were talking a little bit in the parking lot actually about how we have many um, promises that were not kept by the government and um, how that makes it hard for us to move along, especially around the documentation issue that we have um, and the health barriers. So, Brenda, do you want to come up and say a little bit? Okay, that's our creating words in the Marsh from the Marshall Island. Um, first, I really want to thank you, and we really appreciate that you bring this. And I want to first ask for forgiveness for this hatred heart that I have every time. We play these videos. Um, my story is different. Just like Rachel, I'm not from those four at all that was infected. But I'm still a Marshallese, and I'm still from the island, from the Marshall Island, which to me, they're so tiny to try to separate the four islands at all from all the other islands. I think that I think, well, in my heart, I believe that is an excuse to only focus on only four at all when all of us are infected. We have so many women. As someone who's working in the health, we have so many Marshallese women that they have cancer and they're from different islands. And like I said, my story is different. I was born and raised on that small island, Ibai. The one is only three islands away from the military base. I came to the United States in 1986. And I was here until 2010. That's when I went back to the island. I went back to that. Highland, everybody called the slump of the Pacific, because that's where I was born, and that's where I'm proud that I am from. I pretty much have beachfront property, you know? It's great. I love it here. Just across the bay is Ebay Island, known as the slum of the Pacific. More than 12,000 people live here on a strip of land less than a mile long. Many of them refugees from what is now the missile base and from islands poisoned by nuclear testing. And when I went back 2010, I went and worked at the military base. Remember, we're talking 2010. This is only like, what, 10 years ago? I worked for four years on that military base. And I cannot believe how discriminate how people are treated in that military base. If you're hired as a Marshallese, you will get paid $3 an hour at least for a job that is like $8 an hour. 
if you are, you are a U.S. citizen, that's what your rate will start, wages start with. If you're a Marshallese, you're not going to get that wages. When I grew up here in the state, all the posters are like, you have it at every employment places. It says, no discrimination. But here in the island, on that military base, there's no sign for discrimination. And there are so much discrimination going on. And there's no voice for the employee back in the islands. I have no idea why. I don't know if this is between government to government. But as a person who live on that island, that's why they're so poor. Not only that, th that island is so tiny and small. But that military base closed their face and don't see those people in that tiny island. Those people there in that tiny island, because that's the only place that's closest to find job. We cannot rely, rely on our food and all that on that tiny island. Because as you see on that video, we have nothing. There's no tree. The fish, as you heard on that video, they're contaminated. We are people of seafood. That's our food. That's our source. Those, they're not available for us on that small island. So as someone who resides here in Washington and who pay tax like everyone else, I'm glad that I'm working with the public health right now, and I hope there will be more of us and that everyone will make a space for us in the job and get paid and live like everyone else. Because the reality is, if the military didn't contaminate our island, we would be still there. Because who would be in their right mind to come to the state and pay rent when you can be in your small island and have your own free food and your free home and your families? to be with. That's my story. Thank you. Um, so there is someone from the Marshallese Women's Association that I would like to acknowledge, and that's Robin Arun, and she's, um, she's freed up a lot of her time to help us hone our own skills with grant writing and um, just looking out for the proper resources that we need to um, know about for our community and to help them best. Um, so Robin, I really appreciate you. Um, please come up and say a little bit. I know that um, she's also been um, doing some of her own me search because she is Marshallese, but she didn't grow up in the Marshallese way and um, she's actually helping some of us in the community open our eyes to our historical trauma and um, identifying what that is. And so here she is. And I'll start off by saying that Rachel didn't tell me she was going to ask me to talk today. So I'll be very quickly. Um, uh, my name is Robin Naroon and my family is from Likiap and the Marshall Islands on my father's side. Um, my father always told us as kids to keep our island ways, and it's one of the things I love most about my family. And although I grew up here, I feel like I had the Pacific influence in my family growing up, um, and I hope to give that to my, my children and my, my family. Um, one of the things I've done since um, uh, earning my doctorate is do some research on the barriers to health care for Marshallese people in Washington State. And one of the questions I asked was, do you have any barriers? Do you have any problems when you go to the doctor? And I remember one woman asked, telling me, no, I have no problems, no problems. And I was like, really? I, I could hardly believe her. And through the interpreter, I, 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 I kept asking, no problems? And she finally sort of exasperatedly looked at me and she said, I don't go to the doctor. And that's what is happening. So you can imagine 
the Rimashal coming to the United States with all of these healthcare inequities from exposure to the nuclear testing, with our poor outcomes with cancer and diabetes and anomalies, and then having barriers to getting, you know, the first treaty, the COFA treaty, uh, said that we could get uh, health care insurance. In 1996, we were told we cannot have that anymore under the Clinton reform, the uh, Personal Work and Responsibility Act of 1996. We were cut off inexplicably. Uh, people, people say, you know, when I ask people, Marshallese people, do you think you're discriminated against? No, we don't think so. We think people in general are kind to us. But when you, when you hear about the discrimination that my cousin Brenda tells you about in, in the Marshall Islands and the systemic racism that prevents us from having health care, there's clearly some racism. Other things that I found in my research is there's an immense amount of poverty, there's, there's sadness and despair. There's also early mortality. People spoke about the early more. All of the things that you just heard are the things I heard in my research. Early mortality. There's a lot of gratitude, which is surprising. One man said to me when he's talking about the nuclear testing, Robin, I'm so sorry to tell you this. This is the humility that our, our people come with. I'm so sorry to share this burden with you, to tell you the truth, right? Um, so some of the factors that are affecting us to this very day, we have very high COVID rates. In Spokane, we are 1% of the population and 30% of the COVID cases. And that's because of structural factors like racism, poverty, colonization. All of those things are what are affecting us. And I would... The one thing I would like you to take away from today is that to use your agency, your capacity to act, to change the racism and the colonization and the, and, and, and the poverty, those structural factors. It's not anything cultural that we are doing. We, I come from a very long line of, of brilliant people. Marshallese people are incredibly bright and it worked for our country. It doesn't, it's not working well here because there's such a individualism here that's so counter to the way we are. But I would like for you all, you know, especially um, uh, the people from Ground Zero to, to think about how you can work on those structural factors like race. I know you are, and I'm speaking to the choir, but I'd like to ask you to look at, at racism, poverty, colonization, imperialist uh, tendencies. And I think that's all I have to say, except for thank you. Komaltada for your time and, and space here today. Thank you. The Marshall Islands, like how far across are they? Like how big? The whole ocean space? Repeat the, yeah. the question into the microphone. Okay. Um, so the whole ocean space um, stretches out for miles, um, and it's, I know that the land area mass is smaller than the state of Rhode Island, um, and so the ocean mass stretches out for um, thousands of miles, and I'll have to get back to you on that if that's okay. I could actually look it up really quickly. Watching the film, I was curious about the contamination of the fish because the uh, Marshallese are fish people. And so there's certain areas, you know, where the fish are contaminated that I'm wondering uh, in the other areas if, if the fish are okay and how much contamination there is. Tom? <laughs> Okay, so I just found out that there's um, 1,900,000 square kilometers of ocean area um, in the Central Pacific. Um, so the Marshall Islands itself is 180 square kilometers, um, which is a huge chunk of the ocean. Um, and I know that, say it again. Oh. 
there you go. Um, go ahead, Robin. Yeah, please help me, guys. The islands are very small themselves, so you could walk across many of the islands. My father said his island, you could walk across in half an hour from side to side. And, and the, they're only like three feet to seven feet above seawater. And so the ocean comes in and it just keeps around it because they're so tiny islands. Yeah. And like how wide they are, usually most of the islands, they're only like two, three blocks. And that's how wide they are. And of course we have maybe, if we have longer island, that would be maybe the longest one is three miles. Majuro is long because they connect all the islands together. That's why it's 31 miles. Are they all coral? Yeah. Yes. No, they're not coral. If you read Dr. Holly Barker and my cousin Tony De Bruyne's work, you will see that there's you know different documentation about how much radiation exists there to this day, and that's highly debated. Um, there are some, I will say, there are some trust issues regarding the data. Well, first of all, thank you, Rachel, and everyone so very, very much for being here. Uh, and I did have a question, uh, specifically about Kwajalein and Nibai, and that's uh, grounded in the fact that years and years ago, I met Darlene Keju, and she had a very important impact on my mind and heart and my life. And uh, at that time, she was on a speaking tour of California. And <clears throat> we had uh, been inspired there by something called Operation Homecoming, where many people on Ebola went back to their home islands and occupied that land that had been taken by the US military. So we started a series of backcountry security zone occupations at Vandenberg Air Force Base, which is where they fired the missiles at Kwajalein, from Vandenberg, California to Kwajalein. And we tried to communicate as closely as we could with Darlene, with GIF, with other people, and carry out that resistance in California. And there have been waves of that from 1983 to 2003. And seeing this, you know, and hearing also what you said about your experience, you know, it seems to me that I wonder if there's any way, so I guess this is my question, to reignite, I don't know what's going on at Kwajalein or Ebi right now, if there is still, I know in the past, there was resistance for the people, I don't know how that stands now. But what I do know is that because of the situation there, and because of the preparations for global war, I, I believe that there's a need to reignite that resistance by people in the U.S., from the U.S. at Vandenberg, which is aiming missile after missile after missile at Kwajalein National. So I guess that's my question, if, if uh, any of you uh, have any comment about the situation at Kwajalein and Ebi and this idea that, that we here on the mainland of North America, I think, have a responsibility to resist what Vandenberg is doing to Kwajalein. <laughs> I think when you ask Marshallese people to to assist in resisting, which I think no, okay, yes, okay, yeah, okay. yeah. I, I think it's really difficult for right. us. Many right. of us have, you know, work two or three jobs, and so sure, of no, no, that's the power the differential is so great. And there's not, understand. as Chris Kissinger said in 1950, mm -hmm. there's only 90,000 of them. Who gives a how? about t doing nuclear testing. Rachel, I have a question in relation to uh, health care. Uh, has the state, the Washington State Legislature, uh, really done what they need to do for the Marshallese? Yeah, it's a good thing that they have done for us now on Apple Hill. It helps a little because Hopefully that our people can see more advance on their medical to check on health insurance. I mean, on their health issues. It's hard to hear the answers here. Are there any restrictions uh, for any of the Marshallese community uh, in getting on Apple Health for any better health care? Yes and no. Um, we now have access to what. Um, 
low-income families have access to in the U.S., um, which is the Apple Health. Um, the application process is different for COPA citizens, um, and it's actually kind of complicated. Um, I think our needs have already been out there that we have that language barrier, and um, and it's it's complicated because once they apply and they receive the benefits, then all of these um, documents and all of these different pathways come up of how they can get their care. Nothing's really clear. And so that's why our health navigators are in place like Brenda and Lorna. Dora's done some of that work. And Florence and others who are not here right now. And um, if it weren't for these women, it's just a small group of women, it'd be difficult for our community members to, to get the care that was promised to us. Um, so I'm going to say yes and no. Uh, Joanne, now uh, you've had your hand up. I was curious. I know that, that the uh, Republic of the Marshall Islands was very supportive of the treaty to ban nuclear weapons when it was in the process of getting drafted. After President Trump came in, there was there was a change in status. That they that the uh, RMI was saying that we have to wait and see about whether or not we would sign the treaty. I was just wondering. I understood that there are test sites between Kwajalein and California that they keep on using to test missiles. But do they actually have nuclear missiles on Kwajalein now? And and is there any chance that Biden would actually switch Trump's policy about endorsing the treaty? Um, we. I don't know personally, Robin. Do you, I know. Lorna? Yeah, we don't know. We don't, know. We don't even know. We don't government to government, so we have no idea. I, I know. I used to work for Boeing. This was 15 or 20 years ago, but I heard the, the name Kwajalein quite often in certain circles. And Kwajalein and those missile uh, launches we saw were a, a very important part of, of Reagan's Star Wars program. And so this, and the Star Wars program is connected to the nuclear program of stopping an incoming nuclear attack. But it did not use nuclear missiles itself. So that, that I don't think the missiles, they may have simulated nuclear missiles, but uh, they were, the, the goal of that program was how to intercept the missiles that might be attacking. Now, that was some time ago. I don't know what the current status of that program is. But that shows the, the geopolitics behind all of this, the imperial politics of who's going to dominate you know, the skies. And that kind of thing. Uh, James, uh, Jim, uh, Minister, you had a uh, you wrote a question and it disappeared. Uh, can you uh, speak it? I was just uh, concerned about the depth of, of uh, poverty, and uh, I was curious to know about where, what is the source of electrical power among the islands, and of fresh water. Are these things? Do these things have to be brought in? Um, it, it's uh, very hard to believe that uh, you have fresh water sources on the islands. But I, I have no idea. We barely get any fresh water because with the climate change, uh, the raining season is cut really short. So it's kind of dry. I was there 2019, so it's really dry. So we barely and, get and fresh water. Can somebody repeat that? It was very, very hard for me to hear. Yes, uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm sorry for the. Uh, limitations we got on microphones, but uh, what she said is uh, that uh, on her home island, which is quite small, in 2019 there was very little fresh water, and it is, uh, it, with climate change, they're getting less rain, and uh, therefore uh, it's becoming more and more of a problem. And so, um, typically what we've been using from my experience in the Marshall Islands was rainwater, so we had our water catchments, um, and if, if we ever were in droughts, then we would look to city water, 
and Lorna could probably tell us where the city water comes from um, on Marshall Islands. Um, and so we, we depend on the rainwater and now that that's becoming a problem with um, more frequent droughts, we've had to come up with new filtration systems and so that's a project that they're working on in the Marshall Islands. Um, so yeah, it's, it's rough. Carolyn, you had a question? Who? Yes. I just thought, no, stay here. If, if I come up here, then maybe everybody can hear me, including the... Yeah, well, the mic. Okay. <laughs> okay. So my question is, how can we be good allies? What, what are the things that, that we white people in the U.S. can do to be helpful? Thank you, Caroline. Um, so, as I was saying earlier, it would be helpful if you could help the organizations that we have established already build our capacity, our autonomy, um, and also help us hone our skills in advocacy work. Um, we would like to go lobbying um, for our rights, and we would like to help our youth um, have pathways to education, just like what we um, see that was done in Oregon, the state of Oregon with the Marshallese students. Um, we would like to see more um, families live on a stable income. Um, and like I said, there are organizations in place um, that are ready to do the work. We just, um, we just need help in sharpening our skills and um, and uh, just people like you who will just listen to our needs and guide us. Um, and I think it's safe to say that um, we do need some guidance. We are brand new to this country. We've only been here since the 80s. Um, we, we don't have the capacity like most grassroots organizations do because, you know, we, we're brand new and um, so, so maybe that tells you how much guidance and help that we need um, and perhaps you already have ideas rolling in your minds. Let's hear it for, uh, for Rachel 